In this lecture, we're going to study trajectory generation. What we've been doing so far was simple to solve the forward and inverse kinematics, but we did not account for motions of the robot. Let's assume that we want the robot to go from point A to point B. We can specify point A and point B in a space, and we will know the pose of the robot in point A and point B, given the inverse kinematics. But how do we actually get from point A to point B? And specifically to in robotic surgery, what considerations do we have to take into account when planning motion between two points in a space given environmental constraints? So that's what we're going to see in this lecture. So the objective is to, pa uh, to plan a path in the joint space to move the robot between two different configurations, plan the same path in Cartesian space. In joint space means what you're actually planning is the... Um, uh, a function that gives the position of each joint individually to achieve a certain task, or we can do that in Cartesian space, that a trajectory is now specified in the Cartesian space, and then we want the robot to just follow that. And then uh, define the desired orientation using a parametric line, which is another way to represent orientation in space. Instead of using Euler angles, we will use a parametric line. So here's one uh, example where path planning is important. And this is in percutaneous nephrolithotomy. It's a procedure used to remove kidney stones. So here you see the patient on the side there and the surgeon is going to insert uh, a needle, access needle through the side of the, the, the patient to reach the kidney. So there are two steps. You first have to insert the tool into the kidney and then maneuver the tool towards the kidney stones through that entry point in the kidney. So how do we actually do that? How do we plan this optimal path? How do we plan the insertion point where the tool is supposed to go in the kidney and all the maneuvers that will take us from the entry point in the skin to the final destination around the kidney stone? We actually addressed that using, uh, in, in the lab. We had a project, it was a master's project, and that was exactly the problem the student was trying to solve. If we, we were to use a robot to perform that surgery, where would the robot that is recognized here from this picture is the same one used in the lab, where would the robot insert the tool and how would the robot then maneuver the tool towards the stones while causing minimum tissue, tissue displacement and making sure that the tool always passes through the same entry point. If you want to read the full paper, it is available here, you can just click on here and then we'll bring you to the full paper if you want to read it. We'll uh, today study this, uh, the, this scenario here in more detail at the end of the lecture. So for most of the applications you are doing in robotic surgery, we are considering percutaneous surgery, which means accessing the body through a small incision um, or, or a few incisions. So how do we make sure that the robot not only goes to the desired position, but also passes through an entry point, the same entry point for all possible orientations? So that's another question we can try to answer. So let's do, do that first in the simplest possible way. And the simplest possible way is to specify point A and point B, and then define trajectories for each angle of the robot to go from point A to point B. So let's see what do we, how to do that. So we know A and B in the space. So these are the transformation matrices from point A to point B. We are specifying the Cartesian position and the orientation of the robot at those two points. So first we're going to do what we call here a joint space trajectory planning. We'll uh, define um, the way the, the joints, individual joints evolve in time to bring the robot from A to B. So we give the inverse kinematics, the homogeneous transformations of point A and B. In the output, what we get? Well, we get a collection of, if this is a six stuff robot, we get the six angles that we need to apply to the robot to bring it from, to, to, to have it oriented in point A and in point B. That's that's good, but how do we actually take the robot from point A to point B? When you use the robots in the lab and you do move, pose, or whatever, the robot already interpolates that 
for you. Right. But how actually we go from point A to point B. So the idea is to take now the angle, convert the problem from a Cartesian to a joint space, and now interpolate trajectories for every joint between point A and point B, between theta A and theta B, which are collections or are vectors with the um, position of each joint at each position. So there are multiple solutions to this. If you want to go from point A to point B, we can follow any of those trajectories. Any of those trajectories. So we can select now a... Um, a, um, a time function for every joint, we know where the joint starts and wh where we know where the joint is supposed to end. And then let the robots just follow follow that. But how do we actually interpolate now between these two points? Well, it really depends on the goals we want to achieve. We could have any of those trajectories. Those are valid trajectories that would take us from point A to point B. The straight line is not necessarily the best one given the, envir the, the environment constraints that you may have in the application. We're going to define here two things. The time to move from point A to point B. We're going to call that TF, T final. Now that's the time it will take to move the robot from A to B. The robot will start at time 0 and will then end at time TF and the original angle at point A is theta I, theta initial and at point B is theta F, theta final. Now you see here that we are de dealing with individual joints. If the robot has 6 degrees of freedom, we have to, cre to create 6 functions for now moving between theta I and theta F in a time TF. So how do we do that? Well, as I said, it depends on the application. One way is to impose constraints on these trajectories or cost functions or optimization parameters and then solve for them. One example here, very, very commonly used uh, in robotics in general, is to minimize the torque that it will take to move the robot from one point to another. So how do we do that? Well, we have to find the torque first. So the torque is simply the speed of all these angles multiplied by the moment of inertia of each arm. And we can simply, we can now find the, uh, the angles that will minimize this function, the integral of the torques from 0 to Tf. And then run an optimization method that will um, give us the best set of uh, trajectories that will minimize the torque subjected to this constraint that the integral of the speed of each angle is equal to the displacement right? equals to the amount we want the robot the, the joint to travel so this would work very well for general robotics they're basically just minimizing the energy to move the robot from point a to point b now when it comes to robotic surgery what other metrics could we use to optimize motion between two points? Take the smallest display, like the smallest. The smallest distance, displacement, yeah. the smallest distance. Yeah, that's that's a good one. What else? It's time. Time could be something if you want it to be quick. Yeah. What else? What else could you use in robotic surgery specifically? Can you guys think of anything? <coughs> Orientation. The orientation of the robot, the uh, the um, dexterity of the robot, or for example, the, uh, ellip the manipulability ellipsoids along the trajectory, so the robot always has a good manipulability as it goes along the trajectory. What else? What about tissue displacement? If you are able to quantify tissue displacement, we can use that as another metric. What about... Um, distance to obstacles if there is if there are structures that you cannot touch you want to stay away from them that could also be a metric that you can minimize using an optimization algorithm right so these are um, really dependent on the procedure we want to use so we know the orientations at A, we know the angles at A, we know the angles at B because of the inverse kinematics. We know the time we want the robots to take to go from A to B. And you know um, 
Yeah, that's all we know. Now, what, how we interpolate between these two points? We can create a polynomial that is a function of time, and then find the parameters of that polynomial that will satisfy certain constraints when it comes to uh, the robot motion. One example is this arbitrary, completely random, third-order polynomial. It has four parameters, and our job is if you want the, each joint to follow one of these, um, uh, these equations, we need to find a0, 1, 2, and 3, that will now bring us from point A to point B. So we have four variables, we need four constraints. We need to somehow solve for all these constraints. The first one is easy. We can say that at time zero, the angle is, is, is the initial angle theta i. Uh, in the same way that we can say that the final angle at time tf, which is the time it takes from to go from a to b, is theta f. If you take if that's the position, you take the derivative of that, we get zero. Well, we get the speed. We get the speed. Hmm? The derivative of equation four. Uh, then we get the, the speed. What is the ideal speed at the first and last point? Oh, zero. I want the robot to start from rest and stop at the goal point. So we can say that the derivative of this evaluated at zero is zero. And the derivative at time tf is also zero because we want the robot to stop at b. So there we have four constraints, and we have four variables. We can combine all these to solve for A, B, C, and D. Let's do an example here. What's the derivative of equation 5? Is A1 plus 2A2T plus 3 squared. And if you take the next derivative, which is the acceleration, then you get... 2a2 plus 6a3t. So when time is 0, what's theta? When time is 0, theta is theta i. So if we input here, what do we get? A0 is, is theta i. A0 is theta i. What is A1? What is A1? We know that we want the speed at time 0 to be 0. zero. So if we replace that in equation 6, what do we get? A1 is equal to all times here at time 0 is 0. This is 0. A1 is also 0. Right. If we want the speed to be 0. If we want the speed at time zero to be um, theta i dot, then it's simply theta i dot, right, which could be zero if you wonder if the robot is starting from zero. Okay. So we have these two constraints, theta 0 equals to, uh, a0 equals to theta i, a1 equals to 0 if the robot starts from, from rest or to the speed at point 0, the initial speed. And then we are left with now four equations, three, two equations, we can simply plug this back in and find the parameters for theta 2 and theta 3, uh, excuse me, a2 and a3. There are functions of time. All right, and functions of 
theta 1, uh, theta i, and theta f. So now we fully specify then the polynomial to find um, the trajectory between two points. So how does that work now? Well, now we will discretize time in the robot controller and have every time stamp, we tell the controller, go to the next angle. Right? And then the robot moves between them. So here is a, a simulation. If you put this in MATLAB, this is what we get. We input, uh, for in this simulation here, theta 1 is 0, theta final is 90. And this is just for one angle. And you can see that it is indeed a third order polynomial. I'm saying I want the initial and final speed to be 0. So the derivative of that is showing, shown here. You can see that it goes up and then back down to 0. Right? And then the acceleration is just a constant like that. Okay. All right. So this is a, a little simple because we are only specifying two points. You're specifying the final, the final point and the starting point. But sometimes and oftentimes we can specify intermediate points and make sure that the robot passes through those intermediate points. So in fact, you can have a trajectory that is composed of several points um, spaced in, uh, between the lines. So we have more control of where the robot actually, actually goes. One example here is to use two points. Instead of going from A to B, we are going to go from A to C, passing by B. Passing by point B. So now how do we solve this problem now? Well, now we need two polynomials. One to go from A to B and one to go from B to C. And you want to specify the time it takes to reach B and to reach C. We're going to call that time T1 to go from A to B and T2 to go from B to C. But I notice here that each of these polynomials are only are, are analyzed um, within different time steps. That is, theta a b is only valid for zero between zero and t one, and theta two, uh, excuse me, theta b c is valid from also. We reset time here is also zero and it goes up to t two. Right, so 0 to T1, then 0 again because you're starting over, up to T1. So what kind of constraints can we impose here? We can impose the initial position, final position, A and B, uh, A and C. We can impose the time. What else? How do we make sure, for example, that the robot has a continuous speed, a smooth speed as it passes through C, through B? That's why the derivative position has a specific value. We specify the slope of both polynomials at B. The slope of polynomial AB evaluated at a T1 and the slope of polynomial BC evaluated at, at 0. Right? Because BC starts at 0. Now what else can we say? We, you can specify the acceleration also to be the same, so the robot just doesn't, doesn't um, change acceleration when it passes through B. But now we, are, we ended up with eight parameters. Uh, eight parameters. So we have to somehow find eight um, constraints to be able to solve for all these parameters. Yeah? Why don't we just set acceleration constraint to be zero? We don't want the robot accelerating while we're or if it doesn't accelerate, it doesn't move. But you give it a constant velocity, so... If you want a constant velocity, well, it will, it will have to accelerate at the, the end or in the, the, uh, at the beginning. Right? But then, then you can have a zero acceleration, but it's a constraint. If you say I want the acceleration to be zero at point B, it's a constraint. You're just saying speed here must be constant. Right? So let's calculate, let, let's now define the position at point A, B, and C. What is the position at point 
at point A is theta A. The position at point B is theta B and the position at point C is theta C. Now using these polynomials, how can you find the, start to find the parameters? If you, if you, by knowing that at A the position is theta, uh, theta A, how do we find a parameter from these polynomials? We are using the first one. first one is the one that describes A to B. And then you do the same we did before because now time is zero. Uh, at point A, time is starting. Time is zero. So theta A equals to 0, 0, 0. We are left with A, 1, 0. So A, 1, 0 is theta A. If you go to polynomial B, we can do the same because we know that the position at point B is theta B. And at B, the new polynomial resets time, and time is 0 there. Right? So theta uh, B at time 0 in polynomial BC, what, uh, what do we get from that? We get A to 0, which is theta B. What is actually theta b? Theta b is the beginning of polynomial b or the end of polynomial a. So if we evaluate polynomial a at its end, which is t equals to t1, that is also theta b. So why are we just, so I don't understand why we're putting t is equal to 0 at b. Like, is that just so we can get the, the equals to the b on the So we have two independent polynomials. Right? So each polynomial has its own time. Time is zero at the beginning, time is t, whatever, at the end. Okay. We, are, we, we are just putting two independent polynomials together. So as soon as you jump from the first to the second, then time resets. So we, so we could, but we're not supposed to put t1 into the position of b to calculate like the position of b to calculate b to zero. Well, we, we, we can, because now, now what we can, we can do is what is actual, what is theta b? is the beginning of B or the end of A, right? So if we can evaluate that, uh, the, the, the first polynomial at T1, which is the end of A, and you can say that A20 is theta B, which is the same as, same as what? Same as A10 plus A11T1 plus A12T1 squared plus a 11 T1 to the power of 3. Okay, so it's actually they're both the same equations. Exactly, now we combine them. And so we can see that there's another frame as well. Like yes, then you would do the same over and over. Yeah. Well, if you now specify the speed at points A and B, we can do the same. The speed at point A could be 0, in which case we find what? We find a11, right? And what is the speed at uh, B? The speed at B is the speed at polynomial BC evaluated at zero, or the speed of polynomial, the derivative of polynomial AB evaluated at T1. T1. All right, so let me write this here, the speed a B is A11 plus A, uh, sorry, plus 2 A12 T plus 3 A11 T squared and the B C is the same, we just with different numbers. Right, so if the if we evaluate if you assume that the speed A must be zero, which takes time equals to zero, then A11 is zero. What is the speed at B? The speed at B is when time is now zero for the equation for B, right? So that's A21.
equals to a21, which is the same as the speed from the first polynomial at t1 seconds, which is the same as a11 plus 2a12 t1 plus 3a11 t1 squared. Right, it's the same procedure we did before, right, but now we evaluate that in terms of speed. And you can keep going. We can do the same for acceleration. We can say that we want the acceleration at B to be constant. That means the end of the, the acceleration of the end of AB is the same acceleration as the beginning of, of BC. So we can do the same again. So here is a copy of the speed. Now we have the acceleration and you can do the same maneuver to equate the equations. So with that we can create eight equations. And we have eight coefficients. So it's a system of eight equations that we can solve easily. I'm not going to do that here because it will take forever and there's no point. But I can, I'll give you the results for that um, in the code we'll post later. All right, so now we have all this, and let's simulate the academic going from point A to point B without point C, just A to B. All right, and then we're specifying those points in space, and you let you, we use the third order polynomial for each joint, right? To go to, to to make the robot go from A to B. What do you expect to see in Cartesian space? Do you expect the robot to go in a straight line, on a curve, on a sine wave? What what do you expect to see? Intuitively, uh, it's very hard to predict. But what would you expect? If you look the tip position from A to B, do you expect that to be a straight line, to be a curved motion, to be Something like that. Like, like, this. like a straight line. Like a straight line. Mm -hmm. uh, with yeah. eight coefficients? With, eight coefficients? with well, four coefficients because you have so, just two points in space, okay. A and B. Okay. All right. So the, the answer is it's really hard to predict because you are not doing the planning in Cartesian space. What you are doing is taking positions A and B, converting that into a set of joint angles. So six on one side and six on the other side. And then interpolating each individual angle from A to B. And then you let the robot follow all six trajectories at the same time. It will go from A to B, but how it gets there is impossible to predict. For the academic, it would give us this. Fairly inefficient. Right? But it would do the job. It would go from A to B following an arc like that. Right, this is this is the academic. That's a six stuff robot. So that's it. Now, do you see any potential problems with this in robotic surgery? Yeah, you don't know where the tool is going. Right, you you are definitely doing what you want. You're going from A to B, but in the way you're probably uh, splitting the patient in half. <laughs> so probably not the most effective way. So what's the solution? So what is the solution? Add more constraints to the B1, yeah. What else could you do? More points, yeah, the same, the same right? Well, constraints are kind of limited to eight, but I, I think we meant more yes. points. Um, what else? What if instead of planning these tasks in the joint space, we interpolate them in Cartesian space? We find a line between A and B, or a specific way we want the robot to follow, and then we let the joints move in the way they want, so long as the tip goes from A to B following that trajectory. So basically reverse the problem. Now we predict what the tip does, and we don't predict how each individual joint does it. So the first one is what we just did. We had a desired homogeneous transformation from the beginning and the end points. 
we got a set of joints, we interpolated them. Now we're going to do the opposite. We have these two. We are going to plan the trajectory to interpolate these trajectories and then convert that after into joint space. You see the difference? Yeah? Sort of? Yeah. This part. Yeah. So for this part, we now have the same inputs, two, po two positions. We're going to take these two positions in space and interpolate them in space. All right. And when you interpolate them, them in space, you're going from discrete points. And for each of these discrete points, we run the inverse kinematics to find now the corresponding joint angle. So the joint angle now is unpredictable because we, we are not imposing any constraints on the joint angle. What we're imposing a constraint is on the orientation and position of the tooltip over time. Not necessarily a straight line. We could be any line that we want. Okay. It's just uh, now like the red and you you just gave uh, some like can be limited like at the past. Yes. So in the first one we were imposing constraints on the way the joints move and then we let the tip do whatever it needs to do. Now we're doing the opposite, so we're telling the tip the tip to go along a specific path and we don't care about what the joints do in that process. What the joint cannot reach is not feasible. We'll see, we'll see that in a bit. All right, so let's go back to the problem we had before here. It's the same problem as percutaneous nephrolithotomy. And we want to enter the kidney. Somehow we, we manage to find this red line. And that's how we want to go from point A to point B. That came from x-rays probably or um, CT scans. The patient body, we identified where the stone is and then identified the best incision point. So we want the robot to enter that point in the kidney over there and then maneuver along that path towards the stones. Right? So we got somehow that a red red path. That's the way we want to go. How do we plan now a path? How do we make the robot follow that path? Well, if we attach a tool like this to the robot, what we are actually doing is um, simply specifying a collection of points in the space for the tip of the robot and that's where the robot is supposed to be and we are specifying a axis along which the path the tool must be positioned so if so we could very well do this using Euler angles we would just find the Euler angles of the tool in each of those orientations and then you tell the robot to go there but there is a easier sort of way to do that because you can see here that all we, are, we actually have to specify is a point for the tip of the robot to go to and a vector that points in the direction we want it to go. There's one thing missing. We can rotate a, 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 a about that vector. Right? So that degree of freedom should not be dis, uh, neglected. So if you're able to specify that point, the vector coming out of it, and then the angle about which we rotate the tool, then we have it. Then we can now have simply a collection of these three things that evolve in time, and now make the robot follow that, assuming that of course that it that it can. One one um, problem here to watch for is that if you interpolate it that way, you may not always get valid solutions. Maybe it's just not feasible to orient the robot in a given position because of joint constraints, because of other, other factors. So, a target in space uh, or a, a, 
A point in space can then now be specified as a point where the robot is positioned and a vector pointing or coming out of that point. So we now have the full description of the robot's desired orientation with this point P in the space where it starts. In this case here is the position of the base here. We know the length of the tool, right? so we can just work our way back to the tool tip. And, um, and then um, the vector that comes out of that point and points in the direction we want to, the tool to be oriented, in addition then to the orient the um, rotation about that axis. So when you convert this problem from the trajectory to the robot orientation, we get what we see in the pur in purple line there, where we have um, a collection of vectors that are now evolving in space. What's the blue part? That's the speed vector of how the robot moves to go from that point, one point to another. And then my positioning the robot in this point here along the vector lines, then we make the tool follow the tool tip. So here we have another way to represent a little bit of math, otherwise you know, you'll get bored. So here, a little bit. That is uh, what you call the equivalent axis representation. It's a way to specify the point, the vector, and the rotation angle, and convert that back and forth from Euler angle representation or rotation matrices. They are exactly the same. They are just structured in a different way. So the idea is that we have frame B and frame A that are originally aligned. We have a vector described in frame B that are vector k, and you rotate frame B about k. Not about xb, zb, or yb, but about a vector k. So that's all we have to specify. You rotate frame B about that new, that axis, that, that vector k, by a amount of theta which can be achieved very well with three successive rotations about either the, the axis of A or B, exactly how we did in, in lecture two. It's exactly the same thing, but now here we just have one rotation. So when you do that, then eventually we get what we see in the right side there. The vector will have components on X, Y, and Z of B and, um, and A. And you can now simply convert, if you want, we can convert it back to a rotation matrix. I'm going to skip the derivation, but this is the equivalent rotation matrix that we would get if we specify the rotation in that way. Right. How does this derive? There's basically two successive rotations using the other angles. And eventually we get to that. In the same way, so this goes from this equivalent re representation of uh, position and re orientation to a rotation matrix. But uh, given a rotation matrix, in a, like in 11, we can work our way back to, the represent to finding the vector, the point, and the rotation that we need to represent it. Which might be quite useful for your uh, capstone project, actually, now that I think of it. We'll have to talk about it. This is just to uh, shorten the the, oh, okay. the the notation here. Oh. I just uh, introduce a new variable. So in the same way, we can go back now, and given the rotation matrix, we can find the angle and the um, the vector that we need. All right, so it's just another way to to do the same thing, but a bit more intuitive when it comes to this particular problem here. Let's assume, the back to our example, let's assume that uh, we, we know points A and B, we know the entry point in the tissue that is fixed. Right, that's where we want the tool to be inserted. And then we have point B that moves along the trajectory. 
how do we find a vector connecting A to B? I'll simply do A minus B or B minus A and divide that by the magnitude of A minus B. So we get a unit vector pointing from A to B. Right? So that's how we define our K value. We take the X and Y coordinates of points A and B. So these are three 3D vector, uh, 3D points, right? So we do XB minus XA, BY minus A, uh, Z minus ZA, and we divide by the magnitude to make it a unit vector. So now we have a unit vector pointing from A to B, and you know how the robot is supposed to be oriented. What is K? Is a vector now that are, is along the tool shaft, yes. right? Anywhere along the tool shaft. So what is the po what's point C? Point C because point C is where we start has to be the robot the robot's tool tip. Uh, sorry, the the robot's base, the robot's base because that's where it starts. Right? So we position the robot there, and then the robot goes down like that. So what you are controlling is. In this example is the robot's end effector, and then we know where the tool is with some trigonometry. But if we shift, remember that we did this in lab two or three, you shift the tool reference frame from the end effector of the robot all the way to the base, then it would indeed be point B. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, then finally, that's all we need, a collection of a point that uh, and the vector along, uh, uh, along which the tool is oriented and then the rotation angle for that. Yeah. So, uh, how many, uh, is it one by one each? Is it, vector? is it a vector? This is, uh, this is a vector. This is uh, three. Yeah, it is a vector. Yeah, this is a three, one by three, one by three is a six. So, one by yeah. six. Yeah, one by six. Yeah. So the city you just mentioned is the base frame, or it is the end at the, the end uh, factor of the robot, where the tool is attached to. Okay, actually, it's the uh, flange of the. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I still, uh, we still haven't really defined how we interpolate now all these vectors, uh, but we can do it in the exact same way we did with the angles. I just interpolate all those points and those orientations in space. Um, a few problems with this. Problem number one, let's assume our two DOF robot there, intermediate points between A and B are not reachable. We know that we can reach A, we know that we can reach B, but there is no guarantee that all points in, along that straight line are actual um, points in the workspace of the robot. When you do the interpolation, we don't really know, right? So you have to check that afterwards. Problem number two, the robot is passing by a singularity. What's the problem with that? It will stop, will get locked, right? it will stop moving. If it passes exactly at a singular point, it will stop moving. If it passes near a singular point, what happens? What's the limitation of that? Theoretically, it will go over the single, the, near the singular, so that's fine. What's the, the downside of it? Aha, the joint velocity will be very high about the singular, around the singular point. And again, not something we probably want to see in a robotic case, and you have the robot doing this, and then all of a sudden it jumps to the other side, right? Because it has to pass over a singularity. And the last one, one of the uh, also most annoying problems we can can have there is that the configurations in po the solutions used to reach B and A are in a different pose. Right? So that would also not result in a smooth motion from A to B, 
at so somewhere in the process, the robot will completely change pose right? because it has multiple different solutions are being considered for different points. So that's not an easy task to path to, to plan a path between two points, as you can see. Right? There's a lot that it has to be taken into account. Okay, so now we have, well, we have an idea. Let me uh, give you an example, a case study. Uh, again, based on the, uh, the, the case of percutaneous nephrolithotomy that we uh, discussed already. So as I said, this was, was um, a master's project. This was done in collaboration with a company from Toronto called Marion Surgical. You can look at what they do. That a link if you want to do... Uh, co-op or something and then we can connect you with them. They work on uh, surgical simulation. So they do exactly the type of, uh, of work we do in the lab except, except that it's all in, in a simulation. They have haptic devices that control a robot in a virtual environment. Right? They control a tool in a virtual environment. And then as you move the, um, the haptic device, you control the tool, you feel the forces being applied to the tissue and back and forth and so on. So that helps uh, with training in, in surgical practice. So uh, they, they work in simulation and may ask, so why, what was the interest of using a robot for that? Well, we can use the simulations to teach a robot how to do the, uh, these, this phase of the procedure, which is inserting a tool in the patient's back and going from that point all the way to the kidney stone. So what you can do is simulate a bunch of scenarios, like doing the way a human would do, find the best way, and then let a robot do that instead. I'm now train the robot to do that instead. So here is the, uh, the problem more formally posed. We have entry point P0. The robot is here. It has a, a, a tool attached to its tip. And you want the robot to go straight to P1, so the insertion is straight. And once you get inside the kidney, then we want to maneuver to another point, P, uh, to intermediate points up to point Pn. And Pn is where the stone is. All right. So how do we plan these, this path? Well, first of all, P1 and P2 are not coincident, so uh, it will inevitably have some tissue displacement because as the robot goes in and moves, so this is the tool tip, right? So as the robot is going here, the tool goes down and the robot maneuvers like that. The, ro the entire tool um, bends the tissue a little bit as it moves along the path. Right? So what would be, in your opinion, a good way to reach point Pn. What metrics, what parameters should we optimize? We have an interesting constraint. We have to pass by P0. That is non-negotiable. Right. What else? Control the velocity of the, the velocity of the robot to avoid damaging tissue. But the velocity? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the path length, for example, we want the robot to use the smallest possible length to reach point Pn, so you don't want this to go all the way there and then back. What else? We want that, that uh, trajectory to be away from other structures because you don't want to puncture through other structures in the kidney, so the distance from that. What else? As the robot is maneuvering, it is displacing the tissue. So another metric could be the displacement induced to the tissue. So to do that, what we did is a little bit more complicated than what we saw before. But if we implement what we saw here, it would, it would work as well. We defined a polynomial that it gives now the, the interpolation between all these points. Right? And our job is to find then the coefficients of these polynomials. And the, way, or the, the constraints we imposed on the system were, were the path, path length. So we want the length of point, the, uh, of curve, uh, curve, um, 
curve P to be as small as possible, the distance to anatomical obstacles, and the tissue displacement induced by the tool. How do we quantify them? Well, this is task specific. If as soon as you change any, something here, everything will change. Mm -hmm. Why is there another point in between those two to like define so that it avoids the like the uh, it's like an obstacle there? Well, there are. We have uh, we haven't defined how many points oh. we have. P n is the number of points. N could be one hundred, which means one hundred points oh. between P two and the end. Oh. The more points you have, is better, right? The more precise you are. Yes, but we we still well that, that sure yeah 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 that can be described. Yeah, that are, that are the more precise you are, but the problem is how do you find these points? Where exactly do you want to go? Right? Because here we haven't really specified the... What we are doing is that uh, we are not specifying... We're not interpolating the motion of the robot, nor the angles of each joint. We are simply defining the optimal path. And then later we have to uh, inter let, let the robot follow that. So here are ways we could quantify that. So this is, again, specific to this problem. There's no point in memorizing this or studying this. Something that you have to, have to come up with. So the path length, if you take any curve, you can calculate, of any function, you can calculate the length along that curve using equation, the first equation here, F1. So we want to minimize F1. The second one is we want to minimize anatomical obstacles. So T is the trajectory, all points along the trajectory, and C is a collection of points in space that belong to sensitive structures. So anything in the gray areas in the kidney, uh, we fill those areas with a collection of random points spaced by, say, 0 0.1 millimeter apart, right? and then you calculate the distance between the tooltip and all points, and you take the minimal one. The minimal one mean, means the closest you are to any sensitive structure. And then we use that as another measure of um, performance. And then the last one is tissue displacement. So if you notice here, the tool will likely enter the kidney like that and then orient itself like this. And when it orients itself, it compresses the tissue on one side and it stretches the tissue on the other side. Right? We definitely don't want the robot to move sideways, right? but it, as, as it, it tilts around that entry point, it comp compresses the tissue on both sides. You see the displacement here is not linear, right? The closer you are to the base, now the more displacement you have. And how do you quantify the tissue displacement? Well, we chose to quantify tissue displacement by looking at how much energy is stored in the tissue. So if you know that at the original entry point, uh, is, let's say the, the robot goes through, it creates a tunnel. It hasn't compressed the tissue yet because it just drilled through and made that tunnel. And then the robot oriented itself this way. Why are we compress, why are we compressing the tissue here? Right between point A and point B. The base of the tip and the entry point. In the entry point, okay. yeah. So, what, how can you quantify the energy in the tissue? If you call, if you say the tissue has a stiffness k, we can simply integrate the displacement to square times one over k. What is this uh, equation here? You probably recognize this from statics. That's the energy stored in a spring. Right, potential energy stored in the spring. Right, and it is integrated between the two points, in this case here, at the length of the tissue that has been compressed. So we have these three fancy equations, and how do we solve for them? Well, we have to go back to the equation we had here, that we proposed that the, the path follows. Randomly select A1 to A A N, evaluate all these three functions, and somehow optimize the process until we find the optimal value for A0 up to AN that it minimize all those three. So there are no analytical ways to do this. It has to be an iteration, an iterative um, 
optimization method that will give us this point A0 to A3. All right, so here is the optimizer. Optimizer just in the beginning randomly generates A0 to AN. We create a trajectory in, in, uh, in the software and we evaluate all those parameters as the robot is now following that trajectory. We take the result and we inform the optimizer about how much tissue was compressed, how far you were from obstacles, and so on. And then the, the optimizer will take that information into account and adjust A0 to AN and then you repeat the process and you do that as many times as necessary until we find a suitable um, value for A0 and AN. All right, so here is one example. The, here we are increasing the degrees of the polynomial going from a second to a sixth order polynomial and you can see that the, the higher the degree the more freedom we have so it's not necessarily better to go with a higher polynomial. I see the entry point, we want the robot to go from here and there, and then interpolate all the way to the end. So here is the optimization result. The first graph you see here is all possible guesses that we input into the system. We just randomly generated A0 to AN and created the trajectories. You see that that doesn't look very good. And then you let the robot run the iterations until we can, we can tell that it converges to an acceptable solution. It doesn't touch any uh, physical structure. Solutions are feasible. The path length is reasonable and so on. And then you can see now the result of the optimization for different points in space. Right? Everything converges to those points. Now we have a path. I can pick one of those, any of those are valid ones, because they have three cost functions. Right? Which one do we prioritize? That's a different story. But I just pick one and I'll let the robot run uh, along that one. And then that's what you see here. That's the trajectory we selected. And then you see the orientation of the tooltip as it goes to the path. Right? We can tell also that uh, the entry point here is moving uh, 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 along a little bit because otherwise it just can't reach. Right? So we have to physically displace the, 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 the robot uh, a little bit. Right? And you can see the other simulations over there. And this one has an additional obstacle over here. You can see the little dot. And then you can see the robot also maneuvering around it to avoid that. We have to get images and then from the images select oh. portions that are obstacles. So if you want, uh, let's say these are two obstacles, we're going to put a bunch of points here. And then let's say the robot is here. What's the distance to the closed obstacle? Well, we evaluate the distance to all these points and then pick these smallest one. So this is the setup we used in the lab. You recognize that robot is exactly the same one you, you're using right now. All right, so that's the simulation here of a kidney with little stones in there. Uh, and the uh, that a big thing on the left side, the right side there. That's a electromagnetic tracking system. We added a small tool, uh, a small sensor to the tool tip. It's a small coil. This guy here creates an electromagnetic field. The coil responds to that magnetic field, and based on the strength of the coil response, we infer the position and orientation of the coil in space. And then you can verify that the results are what we expect because we added a little uh, extra difficulty to this problem because we allowed the tool to bend. The tool is not rigid. So we have to account for bending of the tool as well using a mechanics uh, based model using vibrational modes of a beam. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. In the, the, um, the equation to describe 
the tool. Right. So you see how many different aspects are we have to combine to achieve a feasible solution. Right? It's not trivial. Right. So this could be an interesting design project. Do you, do you have one of these like boxes? <laughs> what, what boxes? Well, the, 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 the yellow, yellow like, thing with a kidney? I would not trust you with it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. But I have other ones that you can, you can use. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, the, the, the purpose of this is just to be a bit more dramatic because you could very well have used a cup with a hole in it. It would have done the same job. But there is one thing, what in the tool, if the tool is flexible, then you do need to uh, evaluate the, the resistance that the tissue poses on the tool. So the tool touches the tissue, the tissue bends the tool, as the tool bends, the tissue moves, and there's a couple of effect there. So that to evaluate that experimental is not easy. Well, the, the way it is done in, in practice is that the surgeon first inserts a, a thin needle. The needle can bend up to the kidney stone. Once they do that, they put a wire in, and then they take the needle out through the wire. And then they take a bigger one, a nephroscope, and go through the wire to the entry point. Okay. And then with that, they can break the stones and take them out. But the complicated part is not to remove the stones, it's to get to them. So that's why we're trying to solve that with a more robust way. 